Okay, I think I got it recording. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good. Thank you so much for, for doing this conversation with me. Hey, it's great. Great to do it with you. Appreciate your interest. Um, I'm recording the, the conversation, if that's okay, for the, for the channel. Yeah, that's okay. I'll have to behave myself. <laughs> Guys, if y'all don't know Dr. Crosby, he has been an inspiration to me. Dr. Crosby, I want to thank you for all that you do. Um, I'm going to put some links to your website in my description box and um, all the courses that you offer and uh, and just some some good Crosby links for everybody to. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, gosh, I got so many things I want to talk about, but I guess I'll try to fire away. <laughs> um. I watched you on a, I heard your podcast the other day with, um, it was on the bros in a basement website. Yeah. It, um, doctor, doc, no, not doctor. Um, it was Brian? Stephen Wiley. You did a podcast with uh, Stephen Wiley uh -huh. mm -hmm. and you had talked about like kind of your exodus from the institutional church. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think you had even talked about like how Augustine had negatively influenced Mm -hmm. a lot of western theology so i was wondering maybe mm -hmm. if we could kind of talk about that a little bit to start with well sure it, it, it's difficult to do good church history in a few minutes but I, i'll just i'll just say from from my journey okay and that's all it is it's just my journey as i you know growing up in uh, basically standard western evangelical uh you know conservative in my case various forms of charismatic dumb you know, I grew up with a certain narrative about church history, right? And the simplest narrative goes like this. Well, the church was pure, and then Constantine came, and it backslid, and the Roman Catholic Church went into darkness, and Martin Luther came along, and he posted the 95 Theses on it, and, you know, he was a great instrument of God, and, you know, bringing the church back to purity, and aren't we the great winners? And as I began to read history for myself, otherwise not just take notes from what I learned from my pastor and not just take notes from what I learned in Bible school, it began a process of, and I'll, I'll just put it to you like this, oh my gosh, they never told me that. They never told me that. I didn't know that. They never told me that. And I had, to, I had the humbling experience of having to admit to myself that I had been brainwashed, propagandized, and done it myself. You know, and, and brainwashed and propagandized other, others. So I, I began to, to read original source material. I began to read not just, I, I did a post the other day. Imagine this. Imagine uh, you're you're in a just a, a a hostile dispute with somebody, and somebody is watching your dispute. And the only perspective they get is your perspective about the person that you have a dispute about. I don't think anybody listening would want that to happen to them, or would think that doing that is fair, or even a good way to get an entire perspective like in a divorce or something. There's always two sides to every story. Well, I just began to realize that in all my Christian upbringing was Protestant perspectives about other people. And the kindest thing I can say is I was told half truths. The more conspiratorial thing I could say is I was outright lied to. Lied to. People misrepresented history withheld facts because if you start to get into the real history here's what happens Rochelle we're not the good guy and the whole narrative that many have been fed about church history starts to unravel and as that starts to unravel then it's like oh my gosh what else did they teach me that wasn't the whole story and it just begins to, to go down a road of, I've been lied to. It's just, there's just no nice way to say it. 
And uh, I don't know how deep you want to go into this, but I, I can give you example after example after example after example of things they never told me about Martin Luther, what he said, didn't believe, never told me about Augustine. And I've done 90 hours of college level study on Augustine. I read everything that Augustine's ever, ever wrote. I mean, I know a thing or two. And, and so for me, that's, that's kind of the uh, easiest introduction way in sense of how did this process start? And there is a domino effect and it's very, two things happen. It's humbling because you have to admit to yourself. See, now it's no longer, oh, those other people are so bad, right? You know, those people are so bad and we're so right. No, I have been lied to. I'm part of the problem. And I've got to get a real education. And that's the other thing I'll stop with this and like to comment. Um, in the evangelical Christianity brands that I was raised in, and then I'm going on, uh, I'm the old man probably in the crowd now, but 45 years of evangelicalism, there is a strong, prevalent, anti-education strain of spirituality where education is the enemy, you know, college, don't go to college, you'll lose your faith, don't read anything but the Bible, you just need the Holy Ghost and the Bible. Well, that's how cults get started. Right. So my entire Christian life, I've had to deal with that mindset too, that if you uh, read history or you read other sources well you know they're like you know it's just it's so it's so sad and that's why we end up believing stupid stuff because right. we be believe those kind of lies that education is a dirty dirty word right man i'm grateful for your education because i know you've taught me a lot <laughs> well i appreciate that and i know yeah. like Go, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say for those that have read my post, listen, education for me is like the guardrails on the river of life. No, I, I like to say it this way. You don't need to be educated to have an effective, fruitful, uh, successful uh, relationship with the living Lord and resurrection. You don't need to be educated to do that. A four-year-old can do that. Right. But for, I say this way, following Jesus is simple. Understanding the scriptures is not. Right. And we think if we have a sixth grade education, which is the average reading level of an American in the in, in the day that we're living in is the sixth sixth grade level. We think that if we have a sixth grade level of reading and the Holy Ghost, that's all <laughs> we need. And that's a formula for a cult. Right, right. Um I want to read something you wrote yesterday. I had posted it on the channel, but it was mm -hmm. like really really awesome and i let me see if i can find it hold on one sec uh do you mind if i read it it was what you had posted on the crosby I'm cafe sure, sure it's brilliant I'm, I'm i'm sure it's revolutionary That's <laughs> no it really was it says <laughs> uh <laughs> Regarding evangelism, Jesus said mm. in the upper room discourse that the love infused unity of the brethren was in order that the world may believe you have sent me. Very literally, our relationships to one another are the foundational key to soul winning. The love of the brethren facilitates, enables, empowers sight in non-believers. This is utterly ignored in Protestant evangelism, not taught, not practiced, not expressed. How such a simple yet humanly impossible command to love turned into behave reprehensively, kill each other in my name if you want to, but be sure to lecture the world about how right you are about what the Bible says, how wrong they are, and how they are going to hell because they are wrong, is I think the saddest phenomenon of the last 500 years. Thinking people have had 500 years to inspect the end result of Luther's doctrine. They have inspected us. Do you know what they have found? It doesn't work for us and they are not interested, rightly calling it what it is, BS. Even Luther admitted and bemoaned that his followers behaved re reprehensively, but for him it didn't matter because as long as they had pure doctrine and they were preaching the word, all was well. 
End result, 30 to 40,000 fragmentations of pure doctrine preaching the word who all think that they are right and God is on their side. As a society and as a church, we are reaping before our eyes the logical end and the inevitable fruit of that belief system. 500 years of malignant disobedience and failure is enough. The jig is up. The tree has not borne good fruit. Those days are over. The axe is being laid to root. Thank you, Lord. I love that. Mm. <laughs> that was really good. I appreciate it. Might need some unpacking, but <laughs> glad to. One of, the, one of the things I like, too, that you talk about is um, how, like, in the West, we tend to view Christianity, th view Jesus through the lens of a courtroom. Like, we mm -hmm. kind of, I know I had heard you talk about that mm -hmm. before, and that was really interesting, about how the mm -hmm. Eastern view is different. Can we mm -hmm. maybe talk about the difference between the Eastern and the Western view, sure. maybe? Sure. Uh, there, again, you're asking really good questions that could take, you know, 13 <laughs> weeks of a college seminar to really answer well. So yeah, my attempt to answer may be inadequate for some, but I'm just going to try to make it short and sweet. For the Western church, meaning the church that came from the Latin West, primarily through Augustine, mostly because we just have so many of his writings, and on the Protestant side through Luther, views humanity's problem as a criminal problem to be punished. The Eastern Church does not view humanity's problem that way. The Eastern Church views humanity's problem as a disease that must be cured and a bondage from which we must be rescued. Those are two very different fundamental postures to the scripture. The honest truth is you can read the scriptures through either one of those perspectives and you can find what you want to find. So you basically have to make a decision. And how you make a decision is then, well, what is your God image? Because your God image is going to influence what you see in the scripture. So then you have to decide, where do I go for my God image? Do I go to Moses? Do I go to David? Do I go to the God who said, you know, if a, if a, if a woman sees her husband in a fight and uh, uh, grabs her opponent's, his opponent's uh, genitals, that woman shall have her hand cut off. I mean, you can find a verse for any sort of absurdity that you want because it's in the Bible. Right. So there is Luther. Luther was trained as a lawyer. Calvin was trained as a lawyer. Uh, Tertullian was a lawyer. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer lawyer and so they bring we all bring those um unrecognized influence to the text and those guys weren't any different somebody said it this way and this is it's a funny little uh, uh adage they said the the west approaches the scriptures like a lawyer the east approaches the scriptures like a philosopher wouldn't it be good if we could lock them in a room together and not let them out <laughs> the idea is yeah there are the both of those elements but the primary one the one from which you get your image of the fundament the nature of humanity the nature of humanity's problem and the nature of the cure of the problem is going to determine what you see in scripture that that thing that you bring to the scripture you will see what you want to see that is the lens that's going to filter everything so if your god image is someone who's rightfully eternally upset with the human species and if you're augustine or if you're augustinian for whom uh, he is uh, honorable and just in sending you to hell and burn you forever for merely being born because even though you are born disabled in sin, you're still morally responsible for that fact. Therefore, God is just and right in punishing you and, and, and burning you in heaven forever, uh, burning you in hell forever. That's a God image. Versus, if you think the human condition is one of a terminal disease, a debilitating power that has captured a whole race, and God is a loving heavenly father who in the person of his son has come to redeem that race and rescue that 
separates from its disability, its malignant terminal disease, that's a different perspective. And you will come away with two very different God images and two very different perspectives of what, what salvation is, what salvation is about, what it accomplishes. There are people in the Eastern Church, not all but some, who believe that uh, Augustine should not even be named amongst the doctors of the church. That's how strongly they view him to be in error. Now, I'm not saying every Eastern guy is that way, but there are Eastern perspectives who just think that Augustine's, and basically, if you're a Protestant, you're Augustinian, whether you know it or not. I mean, you, 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 ju you just are, because that Luther was Augustinian, although he said, Luther said that uh, no one had ever seen pure doctrine except himself. Luther said in the history of the church, he was the only person who'd ever seen pure doctrine. He said that even Augustine, his mentor, didn't see what he had seen. So that's another whole question about many of the things that you and I have not been taught about Luther. We've been lied to about who Luther was and what he did. The, the, the point is, if you're Protestant, if you're Western, you don't have to be Lutheran. That, that criminal prosecutorial mindset is at work. Whether you know, how many of you have heard this? Well, you know. We're all guilty before the bar of God's justice. And, and, uh, and you know, God the Father, has, is, is on, he's the judge, and he's rightly there to you know, condemn you. But don't worry. Jesus comes and gets between you and the judge. And he says, look, I paid for that, that crime, and you get to go free because the judge has been satisfied uh, by, by Jesus' uh, uh, sacrifice. Luther said, and I'm quoting this, this is a quote, quote, it is almost like there are two gods. Because that Augustinian approach, for an Augustinian, God is the problem. God is the one you have to be saved from. And so now you've got the second person of the Godhead, and the first person of the Godhead in this negotiated courtroom battle where the second person has to persuade the first person to be nice to humanity. Right. Luther also said, now this is early Luther. Late Luther got smarter, but early Luther said this, quote, God's true desire is to condemn every human being to hell. But Jesus persuades him otherwise. Luther never resolved some fundamental Trinitarian things and some fundamental God image thing. Now, I don't know about you, but I got a problem with that. Right. Yeah, that's why I'm not uh, Protestant anymore. Right. Yeah, I mean, I know so many people who have this image of God, like he's just so angry at everybody and that he just wants to condemn everybody. But that's not who we see in Jesus at all, you know, and even the, the word says that mercy triumphs over justice. And, you know, I just, I don't know. <laughs> I just, I just feel like, you know, people do have this idea of God as just someone who's just waiting to smite everybody. And I just think it's really, really sad because, you know, that's not who we see in Jesus at all. And it, it mm. even it, it seemed like Jesus was more angry at the religious people in the Bible than he was at, at sinners. And I just, I feel like so many people just have this really warped view of God and, and Jesus. And, you know, I talk about on my channel a lot, you know, there've been times when I've prayed to see people through the eyes of Jesus and I can, I'll look at somebody and like, I'll just start weeping because I will see that person as someone just worthy of, of so much love and so mm -hmm. much compassion. And I just, I don't know. I just. Well, if you're wrong in your God image, you're going to be every, you know, that's a foundational thing. You're right. Everything that your, your God image is going to affect everything else. So that's why okay. it's such a, such a key foundational issue. The author of the book of Hebrews says, that Jesus came not to get 
an angry father off our back, but Jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death. Right. And here, here, here's one, again, the, the things that they just never tell you in Protestantism. How many Protestants have heard, well, the wages of sin are death, you know, and the wages have to be paid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Romans chapter three, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Paul writes in Corinthians that, listen carefully, the sting of death is sin. Well, where does sin come from? What is sin? What is that? I, I like to do meetings sometimes where I'll, I say, how many have ever heard that the wages of sin is death? Everybody's hands go up. And then I say, how many have ever heard that the sting of death is sin? Zero hands go up. My question to anybody listening, is that a fair presentation of the scriptures? Is that a balanced pre No, it is not. And that's my point. We have been brainwashed or given a half-truth message. So that means sin has, an, has a source outside of me. Sin is a power. It's empowered by something. And redemption is dealing with that thing. And that thing is death. Death is not just the end of our mortal existence. Death is a metaphysical power that's been injected into the universe, which injects sin into our being. And these are things that, even as I'm saying it, if you've been raised in a typical Augustinian Protestant environment, your head is probably spinning because you've never heard it. You've never even thought about it because of that criminal, you're guilty, you're born guilty. I actually saw, uh, excuse me for rambling a bit, a bit of stream of consciousness stuff here going on, but I saw a uh, Augustinian Calvinistic uh, uh, a guy on a, uh, a discussion panel, and this was no, uh, you know, guy that fell off the turnip truck yesterday. This was a credentialed PhD, well-known author, and one of the questioners uh, who was, uh, you know, not necessarily a, a friendly questioner says to the, the guy says, well, if everything you all say is true, and if, you know, if Augustine is, or Augustine is, is right, and, and God knows who he's going to save, and who he's not going to save, and you're, you know, babies go to hell for just being born because they have, you know, they've inherited Adam's iniquity, why does God even bother? Great question. And here's what the guy said. God creates people and gives them bodies so that he has something he can torture forever. Oh, my God. That is what the guy said. Now, I give the guy credit for at least working through the logic of his own belief system. Because the questioner was asking a very good, fair question. Here's right. the problem. The belief system is absurd and it's and not it's, loving i mean god yeah. defines himself as love so i don't understand how i just <laughs> i watched your um I, I i watched your your seminar on development of the doctrine of hell mm -hmm. and uh i thought it was really interesting because i actually learned something i, I had once had the the belief that you know I was raised in eternal conscious torment and mm -hmm. I had never questioned that because I thought the Bible was clear about it, yeah. you know, yeah, right, but, I, right. but, but I had also seen people through the eyes of Jesus and I'm like, it, it wasn't making sense. So it was something that I would try not to think about very much and just, you know, but I had a hard time in the back of my mind, believing that God would just torture people endlessly. So what, like, what can I ask, what can you say about like, do you believe in eternal conscious torment hell? And no, I don't. I, I don't either anymore. You know, after I watched your video and I read, um, I read Julie for Werda's book called Raising Hell. And oh, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I don't know, but I have a lot of people on the channel that still, still believe mm -hmm. that way. So what could you tell them? Well, I, I, again, I tell them, 
this is sounds self-serving, but uh, view this seminar, but I'll give it to you very quick. This is in the category of things they don't tell you. They've never told you. Number one, three different words for hell with nine different meanings. So when somebody says, would you believe in hell? I, I respond back, which one? There's nine different versions from three different words. It's not a simple matter. Number two, when people say, well, do you believe in heaven and hell? I say, which heaven? And they say, well, we know the heaven that God's in. Well, which heaven? The Jews believe that there were eight. And that Yahweh existed in the eighth heaven. And that there were seven subordinate layers of heaven. St. Paul mentions three heavens because he was very, and, and again, you know, nobody ever talks about that. Well, you know, we believe that Paul was taken up to the third heaven. Third hell. Well, well, you know, we don't know, but there, but Paul was there and it was too mysterious to talk about. He was speaking like a Jew. And for a Jew, God was in the eighth heaven. So when the people start talking about heaven and hell, because they have this Bible verse and that Bible verse, they don't know what they're talking about. And I'll give you another example. Of the three words used for, the, it's the most unfortunate translation in all of the English translation. Three different words for hell. Sheol, Gehenna, and Tartarus. If you ask a typical Christian, do you even know what Tartarus is? They won't know. Do you know what Tartar? I mean, you know because you've taken the seminar, but I'm saying this for the way. Tartarus is the place that Zeus put all his monsters and half-breed creatures. Now, folks, we got a problem because that's in the scripture. I don't believe in Zeus, and I don't believe in monsters. And I don't believe in a place where Zeus puts monsters just because it's in the book of Jude. Another thing that I find interesting is like even the Greek word for eternity has been mm -hmm. manipulated. You know, Ionian means age. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I do believe in judgment, you know, yep. but but it, it's just like the scriptures have been manipulated you know right. and and even the word for eternity is i what is it ionian or aeonian yeah, aeonian and, and it can that, mean the end of the age or to the end of the time period that's another thing that jews believed in we have a linear view of time right jews did not have a linear view of time they had a cyclical cyclical view of time and they believed that there were going to be eight ages. And when the eighth age was done, it would start all over again. And so sometimes when, when they talk about when it's translated eternal, which is probably the second most unfortunate translating, they're talking about to the end of the age. Not necessarily right. ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And how do you know the difference? You have to look at the context of the verse. You have to do some decent exegesis. You actually have to work the text. Right. You can't proof text this stuff. And honorable right. will come to different conclusions. Can you make a case? Listen, eternal conscious torment is only mentioned in two books, Matthew and Jude, and I think one reference in uh, Matthew and Revelation and one reference in Jude. You have to ask yourself, why are the two most Jewish books in all of Scripture the only place they talk about that? Well, there's a reason for that, and it's in the seminar we talked about. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something that I've, you know, like, I don't want to say that for sure, like, I, I understand what happens, like, but I, I believe that, I guess, I don't know, I just, like I said, I just can't wrap my head around, around mm -hmm. that, you know, I appreciate your attitude, Rochelle, because I don't either, especially, I you know, when you get this mm -hmm. image of God that, that, his idea of, of judgment was father, forgive them, yep. you know, for they know not what they do. There's a reason that none of the great creeds of the church had anything about hell about them, in it, because even the patristic church fathers could not agree on the topic. Right. They couldn't agree because it's not clear in spite of everybody's claims to the opposite. And it looks like this. 
this verse looks like that, and that verse looks like that. Could be this, could be that, could be this. And my attitude is, I'm not going to be there when person X dies. It's not my job. I'm not going to be sitting on the throne of the universe. How about I let those things alone to the one who is capable of dealing with it and who will be fair to every human being? Instead of making that a, 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 a dogma of orthodoxy, that it was never, and even in the Apostles' Creed, the bit about he descended into hell, which is, again, an unfortunate translation, it should be Sheol, was a later addition. The original Apostles' Creed didn't have it in. Why? Because they never could agree on it. So why do we think, because we're, we've you know, been to Billy Bob's Bible school or whatever, that, boy, we know for sure. And if you disagree with me, boy, you're a heretic and you don't believe in judgment. And, well, you know, I mean, those, those conversations are just not worth having. Right. I had told someone one time that I had even Excuse read. Me. <coughs> Excuse me. One time I was in a Facebook debate and I had just finished reading the book, uh, raising hell or whatever and I was kind of like confused because you know whenever you've kind of been raised in eternal conscious torment and you question that I was feeling like a heretic you know for about a week I was wondering if something was wrong with me you know and so I had saw a post someone on Facebook had posted something about hell and so I had even typed well you know I, I was pointing out different things that I had learned from your seminar and from that book and people have this mentality that if you don't if you don't have the same point of view as, as they do that you're not saved or right you know, and it was just very like spirit it felt like spiritual abuse you know like they were yeah. sitting there telling me that I wasn't saved because they you know they had all this figured out you know based on a few verses you yeah. know but there are there are verses that yep. lead me to believe in that there is judgment, but then there will come a time when every human is restored. You know, there are mm -hmm. verses that point to reconciliation. Mm -hmm. There are voices that I mean, there are even verses, you know, you have annihilationism, for instance. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And at the end of the seminar, I try to wrap it up that way that honorable people can come to different conclusions. And by the way, if anybody takes a seminar, I have found out that I've got some bad scripture references on the very last slide of that seminar. It's just way down on my priority list to get in there and fix those things. But but if you have if you see them, I'm aware that they're there. Mm -hmm. And all the more reason why the church fathers do not make that issue a point of orthodoxy for every every reason that you just just said. Right. It's, it's, the, the Eastern Church says says it this way. I think it's a pretty good perspective. They say, listen, we believe we know who's in, but we don't believe we know who's out. That, to me, is very prudent. It lets God be God. Right. And the, we're not saying that there's no uh, uh, rectification of the injustice of the universe. I just believe that God's punishment quote unquote is child training with a redemptive purpose in hand that if there is a shield a place of the dead where people who are uh, you know well how does god deal with the wicked so that they can be exposed to the love of god and to be reclaimed pedagogically like training training a child so right. it's, for me it's not a matter a punishment again that's augustine by the way uh, yeah, the, if you do you mind a little rabbit trail real quick on this topic oh yeah go ahead is, is that okay yeah. um uh all right so if augustine is right you know well we're all born in adam we've all inherited adam's sin not more, the eastern church doesn't believe that either that's another conversation we can do that if you want but and we're all guilty so that means that you know the stillborn baby has to go to hell and, you know, mentally deficient people have to go to hell. And then when you bring out the, the, in, the, the criminality of that doctrine to people, they go to, well, who are we to question the ways of God? Even Augustine believed he, he could see the problems in his own belief system. So with God as my witness, here's what Augustine taught. 
He believes that there are cabinets, little closets in hell, where all the souls of the babies and the unbaptized and the mentally deficient, and God puts their souls in little cabinets until the last judgment. So even Augustine knew that his belief system didn't address the question adequately. And this is the guy who Luther was Luther's mentor and who is the father of Western Christianity. Because he, his, his human spirit instinctively was reacting to the, the injustice of his own theology. So he had to cook up, you know, closets in hell. Whole, basically holding tanks. Wow. Anyone who thinks God would put a child in, in that's just, that's so horrific. I can't even fathom that. I really can't. Well, that's why they, they, they went to the whole infant baptism thing, because they, they, were, they, they put the doctrines together. Well, what that means, my child it could go to hell. If, and, you know, you know, infant mortality was off the charts. I mean, lifespan at the time of Jesus, the average lifespan was like 21 years, 21 years of age. People dying all the time. So you're a mama. Well, that's why they, they baptized the kids uh, instantly so that if they died, well, they, you know, they don't go to the closet. Wow. And then it kind of keeps the church in control, too, because naturally you're going to want, you know, if you're taught that, you're going to want to put your child in that religious system to try to yep. save their soul. <laughs> so it's, it's like manipulation. There's a quote that I can't remember, and you have to forgive me for that. When you get to be as old as I am and doing this as long as I am, you absorb a lot of stuff. You don't always have the reference on hand like I'm doing a term paper or something. But I ran across, across a quote where uh, a medieval church father said, uh, the doctrine of hell is necessary, eternal co conscious torment, it, to control the people. They, they, flat out, they flat out admitted it because they were afraid if they preach the real good news of the gospel, that people would, would live carelessly. Right. And so, so they admitted that they used the doctrine of eternal conscious torment to, you know, keep the, keep the uh, horses on the, on, on, on the range. Right. Wow. That's so, so crazy. Man. Um, what else do I want to ask? I don't know. There's so many things I want to ask you, but I know I don't know how much time you have. Um, I got I, I got an hour. Keep going, and I'm good to at least uh, you know another half an hour if you want. Okay. Um. Huh. What do you? Another thing that I that I see these days is. Can I interject your thought? Because something. Yeah. Go ahead. Very, it's very quick. Another key difference between the East and the Western church on the nature of sin. The Eastern church doesn't believe in original sin the way Augustine taught it. Augustine taught that what we inherit from Adam is criminality. The Eastern church, what we inherit from Adam is death. Listen carefully. The wages of sin is death, not torture. Right, right. It's as plain as plain can be. But if you get go down that road of criminality, criminality must be punished. Because right. our our human sense of how the universe has to work is that that's a that's a punishable thing instead of a thing to be rescued from. So I just wanted to say they believe that what we inherited from Adam is mortality. Doesn't even the Old Testament, don't the Old Testament's prophets say this, that God will not hold the father's sins against the children? You know, the, the thing about, you know, the fathers have sinned and their teeth are set on edge. And then the prophet says, you know, no, no, no that's not the way it's going to be. But at the foundation of Western evangelicalism is a belief system that you are going to be held criminally liable for another person's behavior when the entire prophetic testimony is that not that's not the way god operates right 
But the foundation of Augustine and Luther's theory of sin is the exact opposite. One thing that I was thinking of yesterday is like how it seems like a lot of people have this mentality of God, like he's Santa Claus, you know, like he's keeping the Bible says he's not counting our sins against us. He's not keep love doesn't keep a record of wrong, but people have this idea that God is just up in the sky, like writing down our sins, like watching us, waiting for us to mess up so he can leave us a big bag of coal. And, and don't get me wrong, like, I don't think people should, like, use grace as a license to sin or anything, mm -hmm. or, you know, I, th I know that good fruit is important, but it's just like, I just feel like people have this Santa Claus image of God, where he's just like, like this sky, sky, sky God, just waiting for everybody to, to mess up so he can put his gavel and bang them over the head or something. You know, and it's just sad because that's not who we see in Jesus. You know, mm -hmm. we the way we see Jesus's judgment is, you know, Father, forgive them, you know, and we see mercy and grace and I don't know. How, uh, the, uh, how many people, folks, have ever heard this? Well, God's ways are not like our ways. Okay, granted. But how come in the universe where most people say that, that means God is nastier, meaner, more severe, more retributive than we are as humans. Right. How does that get turned into God gets to do things that we would prosecute criminally if a human being did it, but because he's God and who are we to judge, he gets right. a free pass for behaving in criminal behavior. That, that thing is absurd. Yeah, you're right. God's ways are not like our ways. His justice is not like our justice. That means there's a diff it's constituted by something different. Let me give you a quick example. And this is in one of my books. I can't remember what. I think it's in the, in the new, how new is the new covenant book. But in our, in our uh, culture, what's the symbol for justice? Like, you know, on the courthouses, there's a statue. And what's, what's the, what typically is the metaphor for justice? Do you, do you want to take a stab at it? The metaphor, like the woman with the scales? Yes, got it. Right. Yeah. She has a scale in one hand, and what's in the other hand? Is it a sword? A sword. You, you pass the test. Now, so, <laughs> now that, that tells you something. What is the Western view of justice? Something exacting and precise where it has to be balanced out, backed up by violence. The authority to punish with, and the, the entire uh, Western doctrine of salvation is something has to be paid. Why? He paid it. We had a debt, right? And that debt. So what is that? The balance has to be, oh, and praise Jesus, he balanced it. That's not what the prophets say. The Jewish prophets say this. Let justice flow like a river what what is that metaphor something that can't be contained something that isn't static something that's dynamic something that is life giving something that can't be packaged reduced okay. down to two very different world views about what justice is because the question sitting there well are you like you just said, well, is he just the other kind of Santa Claus that he doesn't care about injustice and he doesn't care about the horrible things that people do? And does everybody get a quote, a free pass? We're not talking about a free pass. We're talking about a different manner and method and essence of justice because God's ways are not like ours. His Thank God. <laughs> exactly thank god but wouldn't you agree that normally when people quote that it's always used as an excuse to kind of get god off the hook for reprehensible behavior well you know if god wants to burn babies in hell forever for being born in adam's sin you know what's the what's the pot uh, pot got to say to the potter that pot and potter verse has got nothing to do with heaven and hell it's got to do with election and calling particularly of israel it's right. got nothing to do with heaven and hell. 
But everybody uses that as, well, you know, we don't have a right to, to ask these questions. That's, a, again, just yeah. another, another misuse of the scripture. Right. And then, like Jesus even says, you know, he's close to the brokenhearted. And, you know, he's, but people think that, you know, if someone commits suicide because of, mm -hmm. you know, because of extreme turmoil, that they're mm -hmm. automatically going to hell. But it's like, here we hear that Jesus is close to the brokenhearted. So it's like he close to them when they're alive, but then when they're dead, all of a sudden, he just wants to burn them. It's just kind of like sending two different messages to me. You know what I'm okay. saying? Absolutely. So it's like, I believe he has compassion for those who have reached a point of, of suicide. And I had, a friend, I had a friend who was real hardcore on that issue. Like, I mean, just, just, you know, it's the ultimate sin against God. Oh, right. Until one of his relatives committed suicide. And then he had a theological epiphany, you know. Again, it's one of those things that's great in theory until it touches you. Right. And, and, and so many people have this idea of God that like he's merciful toward them and their family members. But it's just the other guys who are all, you know, that God wants to toss into hell, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's just like. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think of. Uh, I know a lot of a lot of people have this the whole book of revelation for instance i think is <laughs> has has been oh, like <laughs> well you're just going for the gusto and all of these aren't you good for you <laughs> just these light questions i'm sorry <laughs> all right the whole, like i see a lot of i don't know how to word it but i see a lot of crazy yeah beliefs like related to the the book of revelation yeah. and yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of cults even form from yeah. the book of Revelation yeah. and yeah. just this idea of what, what do you think of the idea of God coming back to slaughter, Jesus coming back on a, on a lamb to slaughter people? Well, like you, whole... you said it again, Rochelle, you asked the question to take 13 <laughs> weeks to answer, correct, <laughs> but you opened the can, so I'm diving into the worms and I'm going to give it to you very <laughs> quickly. There is a reason that the book of Revelation was one of the last books to be accepted into the canon. Because not everybody agreed about it. To this day, there are churches that do not accept the book of Revelation at the same level of authority as the other books. Some Lutheran churches don't because not that I'm a Lutheran fan, but on this one, he was right. Luther didn't even want it in the canon. And if you go to some Lutheran churches, you'll find that it is in a separate section in the back of a couple of other books that Luther didn't like. Coptic churches don't uh, accept it. The Greek Orthodox Church does not accept it for doctrine, dogma, or liturgy. They use it for personal edification only. So that should tell you something. It also took four hundred years of debate before that book was kind of universally accepted and the vote in the council was not unanimous it's been a troublesome book from the beginning and not that i'm an augustinian fan as anybody listening has probably figured out but on this one i think he was right augustine said the book should never be used to predict the future right <laughs> it's amazing to me for people who are augustinian in everything except that right. the premillennial literalism began in the 19th century in north america before that the overwhelming perspective of the church was what's called amillennialism and a non-literal uh, understanding of that book. That's yes. just something we have to be honest about. People say, oh no, you know, and I've read all the, oh no, we can trace premillennialism back to the ancient church fathers. You know, and you find one guy who maybe was a premillennial. The overwhelming perspective of the church fathers was it's a Jewish apocalyptic typological book 
should not be interpreted literally and should not be used to predict the future. But my my gosh, the amount of money that's being made on oh all goodness. the books about Revelation. You turn on TV, that's all they're talking about. And here's it, my It's attitude. like it's become its own gospel almost. Yeah, exactly. Well said. It's almost like a subcult of its own existence. My thing is this. So let's say, uh, Steve Crosby, you're wrong in everything you just said. And person X, you are right in the book of Revelation. What has that got to do with me loving my children, my wife, my neighbor, feeding the poor? Absolutely nothing. Right, right. Well, I'm right about God's last day plan for Israel. Okay, let's say that you are. Do you, do you cheat on your taxes? Do you steal stuff from your employer? Are you tight with your money? Are you an, a glutton? Who cares? Those things belong in God's hand. God has the future. Let him have it. Right. We look at it and we see the victory of Jesus. That's what that book is about. It's a, it's, it's a dream state. It's an altered, what's called an ASC, altered state of consciousness, uh, unveiling of the victory of Jesus in the language and the images and the metaphors for the people of their time. Right. I hear the most ridiculous stuff, like just like one, there, there was some verse about like some, something clothed in purple. And then like people were speculating online. Oh, well that's, that represents Kamala Harris's dress. That purple is all about, uh, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking whenever they wrote, one of the thoughts I had was whenever they wrote Revelation, they weren't thinking about Kamala Harris's dress. And it's just <laughs> some, of, some of the most ridiculous stuff. Just, But just it comes from the God, God image too. So we're right back to where our conversation began. Because we're the good guys. You're the bad guys. Our God is the true God and he's going to get you. But we're okay. Right. And I mean, that's that's why it's a very Jewish book. Because for a, a, a pre-Christian era follower of Yahweh, what was the number one way that they knew Yahweh was the true God? How did, how did Yahweh prove to, to Israel that he was the true God? How did he do it? Sending Jesus? No. Before Jesus. For Moses. For, 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 for any of them. How do we know that our God is the true God? Because he kills your God and he kills all our enemies, right? The whole, the whole Old Testament motif is our God, you read the Psalms, Yahweh's the greatest because he's the, the he's, uh, rides upon the heavens, plural, back to how many are there? And then he's the God above all other gods. How do we know? Because the horse, he kills the bad guys. Jesus comes to fix that part of the God image that Israel had. You see it at Calvary. Right. When, Jesus, when Jesus preached in the synagogue in Luke 4, he started that message and they loved the sermon. He's, oh, no man has ever spoken like this. How did that sermon end up we want to kill this guy and push him off a cliff because when he quoted isaiah he did not quote the part about israel's enemies getting it stuck to them and he closed the book and said this day it is fulfilled it so enraged them the idea that god is not going to stick it to your enemies they wanted to kill him that's how deep, we, and see, in our world, Democrat versus Republican, conservative versus liberal, you are destroyed. You need to be destroyed. And so you go right. to the book of Revelation, and we have proof. And I had somebody tell me this one. This is no joke, Rochelle. This, this guy had been a, a pastor for 25 years, and this, I am quoting what he said to me. If Jesus told me tonight to go and shoot my neighbors, I would do it. Because, you know, God told people to kill other people and he's coming wow. back and he's going to kill people. 
<sighs> that's where that's where our our friends on the on the on the democratic and an and unbelieving spectrum are right about us. We're out of our ever loving minds. Right. Because we, 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 we quote some bizarre passage from Leviticus or, 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 or Revelation. Rochelle, that guy had been a pastor for 25 years. And so I fired back on him and I said, so are you telling me that uh, shooting your neighbors for Jesus is, is, is a new form of evangelism? Well, if God told me to do it, who am I to argue oh with my that? Goodness. Back, back to Cal the Calvinistic. If That's God wants to kill people and he wants me, how, and, and then I did this, Rochelle, and this really made him mad. And I said, how is that any different from the God of the Islamic terrorists? And you know what he said? The only difference is our God is the true God. The reason those guys are, are bad because they're killing in the name of a false God. If I kill in the name of our God, it's okay. Oh, wow. That's, that's crazy. I wish, and, and it's not rare, Rochelle. And then, like I said, this is not some guy who's two years old in the Lord or has got a hold of a scurry verse in Revelation. This is a, a guy who's leading a church. I know another guy. Uh, 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 a guy who at the time is my age has since passed. He had a, he had a cave in the mountains full of high power weapons. He had a compound with like guard towers, you know, like in, in uh, uh, World War II prison camps, guard towers, barbed wire and everything. And, and, and he had, he had, he had gold bullion and firearms and, stacked in this cave as far as you could see wow. because because you know white killing those horrible people that's what's going to happen if you're literal about the book of revelation because if jesus is our standard and jesus is coming back and he's going to use his armies to kill people so you know fill the valleys full of well why can't we right you're going to find a proof text for anything you want to believe Right. And that's like the whole, I think David Koresh was like, not David Koresh. And I don't know if you've heard of Lori and Chad Daybell. They were acute. They, they murdered their kids, but they were like into this big end times cult. And like, they had this belief that they were a part of the 144,000, but that everybody else was evil, mm -hmm. but that they, they were the chosen ones. And, you know, it was the whole us versus them. And they just, they ended up killing their kids because they thought their kids had a demon. And just, just the amount of craziness that I see just, just because of misunderstandings about the book of Revelation are just insane. And particularly on the issue of violence, the idea of holy violence, that violence right. in of God is okay. Jesus came to put an end to that way of thinking. That's part of the change between the Jewish era and the Christian era. At the cross, Jesus put an end forever to the idea that God is in the violence business. Right. Even whenever they had, like last year, I talk about this a lot on the channel, but like last year, even whenever like we were, we thought we were going to war with Iran, I was shocked at the number of Christians that were just like, slaughter them bomb them you know they're the enemy and it's it's just like they were ignoring the whole sermon on the mount you know love mm -hmm. your even if you perceive someone as your mm -hmm. enemy mm -hmm. which i don't perceive mm -hmm. them as my enemy you know they never did anything to me you know but you're supposed to love enemies love those no you're not not according to fun i'm joking with you i'm interrupting <laughs> and i'm joking with you because of how i had a baptist fundamentalist look me in the eye and say this jesus is not our example his teachings were before the cross that was the jewish dispensation and nothing he taught applied because wow. we're we're under grace wow i and i asked him i said well isn't jesus the pattern human isn't he the first one? nope jesus is not our example because he's god huh? and we can't expect so so now we're getting into Back to God image again. If you don't get your fundamental doctrines of God right, you're, you're wrong. This was a guy who was teaching Sunday school. He's the adult Sunday school teacher in his Baptist church. 
who thinks that it's okay? They have to, Rochelle, to justify the type of stuff that you just said. Well, you can't. And I, I've heard people say, oh, Jesus wasn't really serious. That's a great wow. idea. Wow. Because if you're serious about these things, it puts you into crisis. And here's the deal. It's going to come in conflict with American ideals. And that's when it really starts getting ugly. Man. That's, that's intense. I imagine a Christian saying to another that Jesus is not our example. And, you know, developing a dispensational scheme to just wipe away all of Jesus' teachings about his ethics. Now, that was for the Jews. It wow. doesn't, apply, doesn't apply to us. Goodness. Of course, I didn't get into a wrestling match with them. I was, I was visiting somebody else's home. I didn't want to ruin their meeting by, by blowing up their world. It's not my place to do that in somebody else's meeting. But it was a gut-wrenching conversation to think there are people who believe that. Right. People who think that shooting your neighbor for Jesus is okay. Well, it's in the Bible. David did it. He was a man after God's own heart. Moses did it. Moses is the prophet, you know. God told Joshua to wipe out people, you know, and, and that's the Bible. And, oh, and well, now we're into you have to decide how you're going to interpret the scriptures. Is <laughs> Jesus the final word of God or is he not? Right. And is then he even better than Moses? I, I had somebody walk out on me, Rochelle. I preached Hebrews chapter 2 in a meeting, and a woman in the front row got up and walked out on me when I said this sentence. Jesus is better than Moses. All I'm doing is quoting Hebrews chapter 2. Got up and walked out. Oh, wow. <laughs> Goodness. And even, like, the whole, the whole story of, I think it's called the transfiguration, when Jesus appeared before Moses and Elijah and, and uh, they were all up there. Jesus was up there with the disciples and God even spoke and he says, this is my son. Listen to him, you know, and we're even told that, you know, that the only time we see God clearly at any point in time during the Bible is through Jesus. It's not through Moses. It's not through Elijah. It's, it's through Jesus. So he is the model. He's the example. So I don't understand why that's even up for debate. <laughs> I yeah, guess go ahead. I just don't understand why people think that Jesus and Mo Moses hold the same equal weight, you know? Well, it's what happens when we have a commitment to uh, every word of scripture being of equal weight. It puts you in a bind like that. This is for the folks that may be listening to this. John, John 1, 18. No one at any time has ever properly perceived God with understanding. But Jesus Christ has come to make him openly understood. And no one means no one ever. That includes Daniel, David, Abraham, Moses, Joseph. St. Paul says they were looking through a veil. St. Paul says they had an understanding like a shadow. They saw a shadow of the thing. We come to Jesus. Jesus is the essence of the thing. And I sometimes tell people, I said, you know, that's very basic, very basic apostolic teaching in the sense of consistent with the, you know, with the apostles' view of Jesus. I said, if we don't believe that, you know, we really ought to just be Jews and get it over with. Because if we don't believe that, our entire existence as followers of Jesus, as, as the Christ, is, is misled. If Jesus is not the definitive, final, explicit, no exception image of the invisible God, we should be Jews because he is back than Moses. Right. Wow. Well, I hope people get, you know, I hope people learn something. I, th I think, I think, you know, I definitely think people will learn something from this, you know, I hope so. <laughs> Me too. Thank you, for, uh, you know, doing the referrals and all, all that stuff to the various pages. I appreciate that. Oh, I even have you on my channel. If you go to the interesting channels, I have you. I only have like a couple, but you're one of them. <laughs> um, thank you. So I don't I always half that stuff. So <laughs> somebody 40 years younger than me, like yourself, has to do that because I don't even bother with it. I even know how it works. <laughs> oh, man. 
But man, I appreciate talking to you today. There's still All right. one day, maybe I want to pick your brain about deliverance mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, some stuff like be a that. Great topic. Would you like to do one? Because honestly, we could probably do 30 minutes on that topic alone very easily. Oh, yeah, I'd love to, because, I mean, I've dealt with a lot of stuff, you know, and I mm -hmm. feel like Jesus has shown me some stuff through mm -hmm. that, but. Well, let's, you know. let's set up another time to do it. No, we don't have to do it right now, but let's set up, set up a time. Okay, that sounds great. All right. Cool. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I'm going to try to figure out how to get this up on my channel soon. You know, right. I've never worked with Zoom, but I recorded the meeting, so I'll figure it, I'll figure it out. All right. Thank you, Rochelle. Talk I, I appreciate you, sir. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.